Ralph here once again. Thank you for joining me. It is December 20th at 12, 10 a.m. this Sunday morning. Before we get into data analytics, what I'm going to show you right now is probably one of the worst cases of publisher bias that I have seen in a while. What we are looking at at this particular chart is basically the effectiveness of a surgical mask with a 65% filtration rate. What is interesting about this one particular chart? The whole argument to reference the SARS-CoV-2. Most of the pandemic mitigation strategy of SARS-CoV-2 relies upon that the virus itself, or the basically the COV-2 that causes the virus, is airborne, not aerosolized. For those not familiar, airborne means on spit, saliva, so on and so forth. Aerosolized far smaller micrometer particulates or microns and what you're going to be looking at here is if it goes below five microns which a lot of scientists have petitioned the world health organization saying hey it is aerosolized it is not airborne in fact as we go through the studies you're going to see a lot more saying we're aerosolized if it is aerosolized what this means to you is this if you inhale this particular SARS-CoV-2 through a surgical mask with a 65% filtration rate that lowers or slows the breathing down to 15 liters per minute. What the, or even, you know, anywhere in this range regardless. If it does, it gives the opportunity for the SARS-CoV-2 to basically take hold in the nasal membranes. Henceforth, what do they do when they go to test for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19? They use nasal swabs. So look at this chart very carefully with mask, without mask. Here is where publisher bias ends up being a danger to society as a whole. The article or the research article said really or implied nothing about used masks. For example, let's go this way. Media took it and said wearing a used mask could be worse than wearing no mask at all, so on and so forth. That is not what the article implied. Albeit, the gentleman did say, you know, in reference to basically other masks, if it's below 25% filtration, yeah, it could be kind of worse, could slowing down the airflow. It was used once in the public release. In the actual release itself, here we see the word used before I start with the article. Let's just go down. Use a laser minimum caused by wearing a mask. Was used to stimulate. Simulate. Used in the study. Was used to control. Used to stimulate. Nowhere. Nowhere. Even caused part of used. Does it imply wearing a used mask? That is vital. Now, as we get into the research as follows, let us begin. Again, review your headlines here. This is where you do not want to rely on the press because obviously the press is not even reading the study itself. And I'll have all the links for you as well. So let us begin. What did the study actually state? So as we get into it, let's start with mask one. All right, this is what we're looking at. It is natural to think that wearing a mask, no matter how new or old, should always be better than nothing. Our results show that this belief is only true for particles larger than 5 micrometers, but not for fine particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers. All right. Produced by the American Institute of Physics. And we proceed. The lower the speed, remember we're talking about that one particular area we're talking liters per minute airflow, the lower the speed. Near the face favors the inhalation of aerosols in the nose. So even though masks can filter out a certain number of particles, more particles escape in mask filtration can enter the respiratory tract. They found the filtration efficiency of a three-layer surgical mask can vary from 65%, if new, to 25%. When used, so wearing a 65% mask properly provides good protection, but wearing a 25% filtration mask can be worse than not wearing one at all. all right, there is your word used. That's the one time it was utilized in the major public release. The actual study, they never were 
use the word used because they could be implying bandana, cloth, mask, so on and so forth. So here we go back to that chart once again. 15 liters a minute. That is with a mask that is fully intact. Now we go to what this study actually said. Ready? Here we go. And let's bring it up here. It says, the nose is a unique role in this COVID-19 pandemic for several reasons. It is the first physical barrier of our body to keep ambient aerosols from getting into the respiratory tract. Unlike the mouth, the downward nostrils can effectively prevent large particles from being inhaled due to large inertia. The nasal mucus and immune cells constitute the second line of defense against invading viruses. However, the nasal goblet uh, secret, uh, can I say secret, secretory, secretory, secretory cells, apologize for that, are also confirmed, are also one of the three confirmed binding sites for COVID-19 viruses, where two necessary enzymes for cell invasion, ACE2 and TPRSS2, trend, uh, coexist. This explains the usage of nasal swabs in COVID testing. The other two sites with these two enzymes coexisting are the useful epithelial cells of the alveoli, it's late at night, I apologize, alveoli, and ileal absorbed cells in the small intestine. Which is interesting because a lot of people in the beginning were uh, complaining about stomach upset, intestinal upset, and so on and so forth. In this study, we found that the protective efficacy of a mask for the nasal airway decreases at lower inhalation rates. Here we go particularly at 15 liters a minute. The nasal retention of one micrometer to three micrometer ambient aerosols even higher by wearing a 65% filtration mask than without a mask at all. This situation is expected to worsen for flow rates lower than 15 liters a meter or wearing a mask with lower filtration efficiencies. So yeah, now you get it. A 65% filtration mask is worse than wearing no mask at all when the, basically the virus itself or what caused the virus is aerosolized. Do you understand? It just gets worse when basically uh, the filtration rates are lower filtration efficiencies. That is what the research stated. It had very little to do with wearing a used mask. The press did a tremendous, tremendous disservice to the public as a whole, as well as deciding political bodies or political bodies. So that goes right into the role of why the Den Mask 19 study was so critically important and why no one is potentially seeing the correlation that is expected with mask wearing. Problem being is this, so much attention has been where focused on mask and social distancing that it basically is distracting from potentially other things, for example, UV lights, nutritional fortification, and things which truly do have a strong correlation with basically helping people, i.e., case in point, let us go to the Denmas study and reiterate what they stated. In this community-based randomized controlled trial conducted in a setting where mask wearing was uncommon, it was not among the other recommended public health measures related to COVID-19, a recommendation to wear a surgical mask when outside the home, among others, did not reduce at convention levels a statistical significance. Incident SARS-CoV-2 infection compared with no mask recommendation at all. And of course, that was also from, that's the Denmas study. The effectiveness of adding mask recommendation to the public health measures prevents SARS. And that was just recent. So here we have that. And now we have, again, this study as well. It's not basically to say that masks don't work. It is basically trying to imply that our intention and focus may be better suited in other areas instead of focusing on an arena which is just tearing people apart. Yes, the particular size, 5 micrometers to basically 10 micrometers or greater, it can have some impact, but the question is no. Wearing a mask is not better than doing nothing at all. You have to come to terms with that on an emotional level and a science level. 
If these scientists are correct, and it does come out that basically it's reducing airflow and therefore allowing the virus to basically impact the nasal passageways, that could explain as well, besides age, why nursing homes, albeit 13% of the population, are responsible for 40% of the case fatalities. All right, with that in mind, let us proceed, or I should say well, cases or case fatalities as a whole, whatever it is. I believe it's that area. If I'm mistaken, please forgive me, but I think it's 40% of case fatalities as a whole. So let us proceed as follows to the next element in the research. And with that in mind, let us go to do, 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 do. And I'll have all the links for you at the exact same time. Let's get this one out of the way real fast too. Came out, the new study linked cadmium to more severe flu and pneumonia infections. They found out basically here early in the pandemic, uh, was starting out in China, a large percentage of people dying from the coronavirus showed a few characteristics. They were male smokers and older. That prompted them to look at cadmium, and cadmium, they believe, played a strong correlation in reference to the virus itself as well. Next, vitamin D. Once again, probably the strongest correlation in reference to the virus being harmful to an individual or a culture or a nation than anything else. But yet, it is looked over time and time again or passed over as being not important when actually it should be the primary important thing. Alarmingly high vitamin D deficiency in the United Kingdom. Now wait to see how deficient uh, certain cultural groups truly are in vitamin D. And here we say over 50% of Asians live in the UK are severely deficient. How deficient? You ready to begin? Let's, let's look. Over half a million people surveyed quote the researchers, we found that 57% of Asians were severely deficient in vitamin D. That is 25 nanomoles. Now, obviously, we're entering the winter months. Vitamin D levels tend to decline because UV lights, which we'll basically will go into in a second as well, as well as other cultural groups. Now, there's other factors that could play a role. But if just by boosting vitamin D levels up, you can basically support people. Why not? But, I mean, obviously, the correlation has already been shown to be stronger than wearing a mask as, as it is. Let us begin as follows. Or I'll proceed forward. This is, what, 25 nanometers. When I saw this, I was thinking nanograms initially. This is nanomoles. This is how deficient it is. Just to give you perspective. 25 nanomoles, not nanograms, milliliter. It is Ricketts level deficiencies. So when you have a cultural group in any country, which basically is looking at having less than 25 nanomoles a liter, Ricketts level vitamin D, and knowing how incredibly important that vitamin D is in basically to prevention of or transmission of COVID, what it turned out to be right here. And this was one we just covered not too long ago. In older patients, this was from adequate levels of vitamin D, reduced complications, death among COVID-19 patients in September. I bet you many of, you did, many of you have not even heard of this research. For what reason? I have no clue. Please forgive whatever news sources you're listening to. But here we go. In patients older than 40 years, they observed that patients who were vitamin D sufficient were 51.5% less likely to die from the infection compared to the ones which obviously didn't have as much. Quoting, they found that a sufficient amount of vitamin D can reduce the risk of catching coronavirus by 54%. So if you're in the wild and you had no emotional connection to any of the research as follows, someone handed you a couple of uh, bottles of vitamin D or a surgical mask, what would you choose? Think about it. Take the media, take judgment of friends and prejudices and other aspects out of it. What would you choose from a technical numerical standpoint? What would you choose? That's what I'm trying to get at. All right, let's proceed forward as follows. All right, they found out that COVID-19, remember all the articles in the beginning saying how COVID-19 damages hearing and so on and so forth. I'll have the link to this as well. No, it does not damage the auditory system. Again, bias and confounding factors can play a huge role because sometimes you have this mass hysteria that kicks in. But to proceed forward. LED lights found to kill coronavirus, global first in fight against COVID-19. 
It's not necessarily the LED lights itself was not the first because obviously we saw uh, 222, 254, 265, different varying level of nanometers of the UV lights can play a huge role. But this was what they're trying to emphasize here is that the lights at 285 nanometers can actually wipe the virus out or at least 99.9% .9 of, let's say, SARS COV-2 because you really you can't kill it. You're actually just disarming the RNA, so to say. Less than a half a minute to destroy more than 99.9% .9 of the coronavirus. Again, you look at things at retirement homes, you think of public places, you know, even after closing, uh, form it, knowing that uh, that basically the virus, if it's aerosolized, can last for hours. Yeah, this would be a great way of mitigating that potential effect. All right, to move forward. All right, this is important. This came out, the mortality charts in reference to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, whatever. This puts it in perspective. This is between March and 2018. All right, so here... I'm trying to do this to disarm part of the fear and bring it more into a rational role. Again, a lot of individuals tend to have come, uh, other complications and other diseases so on and so forth. I'm trying to get at the fact that basically you can build a tremendous nutritional firewall just by making sure there's zinc, selenium, vitamin D. I, it's weird because you recommend you know something which people are terrified of, something as simple as taking a couple of vitamins. It somehow seems too simple or or woo-woo type thing, but the science stands strong on it as far as the correlation. So if you're looking at people in retirement homes and nursing homes, they're still not recommending vitamin D and things like that. How incredibly easy it would be to give a nutritional drink that's fortified? I mean, just try. What's it going to hurt? The whole argument initially was, oh, wear a mask, social the distance, you only have to do it for 15 days. What's it going to hurt? Well, you know what? Now let's turn the tide. What's it going to hurt to eat healthy or be healthy or take nutritional supplements, get some sun? What's it going to hurt? Here's your mortality figures, and that's where we're still getting hit the hardest. But again, if the same, same amount of attention was being paid to heart disease or other type of uh, ailments, you know, then this would probably be lower. Because you're trying to prevent heart disease by keeping people healthy. If you're healthy, you're less prone to that. And heart disease often is dietary in nature. So not for everybody. There are a lot of unfortunate individuals out there which really were victim of circumstances. But in regardless of that, seriously, that's what you are. Now, if you're between 25 and 34, more likely to have a traffic accident, so on and so forth, drug overdoses, so on and so forth. But once you hit it above 65 and older, actually, I should say 55 and older, then basically your dynamics begin to change pretty dramatically uh, in reference to COVID-19. So there's your information per mortality per million. So between the age of 5 and 14, regardless of comorbidities, you're looking at 1 per million uh, between March and October 2018. So at 25 to 34, you're looking at 38 per million between March and you can get an idea of the whole lineup here as far as that's concerned. All right, it's an important chart to look at. All right, this is the mass thing we just looked at. So I'm move forward. There's a few I don't want to miss here. All right, there's that. Temperature. SARS itself being temperature sensitive. Now, again, it's an interesting thing because as it, it does become seasonal to some aspect, what they discovered in reference to SARS-CoV-2 was this. In both liquid and bare conditions, elevating the temperature to about 93 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes degraded the outer structure. So basically, now here's that word again, aerosols. Because aerosols are a big thing. Now, we just talked about that in the surgical mask. You see aerosols pop up a lot in reference to that. Now we can continue forward. COVID-19 spread increases when UV levels decrease. Now, what do they correlate this with? They correlate it with the following. The team analyzed that in multiple ways and consistently found that the higher the UV, the lower the spread of COVID-19. We're in the winter months now. We're telling people to stay indoors, which basically they found that COVID-19 is 
really, really devastating in areas with poor air circulation, i.e., going back to the 65% efficiency surgical mask. But it remains unclear what mechanism is driving the effect. It may be that UV destroys the virus on surfaces or in aerosols. There's that word again, aerosols. And why is aerosols important? Because it's below 5 micrometers, then basically wearing a surgical mask with a low airflow can be problematic. On the sunny days, people go outside where there's less transmission. It's even possible UV reduces susceptibility to COVID-19 by stimulating the production of vitamin D and boosting the immune system. Goes back to correlating with the vitamin D study as well. So UV light is pretty much a good friend in reference to helping combat COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. And as well, well, there are many different factors, as well as vitamin D and so on and so forth. All right, let me make sure see we covered everything here. All right, cadmium, there's the vitamin D, uh, the auditory, the LED lights, the mortality charts. I'll put the links to everything, the temperature and the UV light as far as being seasonal. All right, now we go right into the data analytics. And remember, before we begin the data analytics, I want to focus on this really uh, for a second too. The data analytics really coming out with the exact same thing. Now we're looking at heat maps and so on and so forth. We're trying to find a correlation between population density. We're trying to find a correlation between age and so on and so forth. It's it's basically to see if mitigation or pandemic mitigation strategies which are in play are actually working or if it's just more seasonal and people are taking credit for when it works and pointing fingers when it doesn't. From a data analytics standpoint, from what you'll see from my very amateur aspect, I we can't find any relation. So with that in mind, let us proceed. I'm going to run through it kind of fast. And here we go. Let's go back to our heat map. All right. I included facial coverings in basically what's called our world and data. data. Uh, the APIs and things like that, if requested, I'll get you all the information. Again, it's our world and data, COVID tracking, uh, human health services, so on and so forth, depending on you know, uh, U.S. government where we get the data. Here is our correlations between facial coverings. Now, what facial coverings are doing here is we're looking at basically the elevation of the facial coverings. Does increasing facial coverings to, let's say, a level of four, as such, have any strong correlation between deaths, illnesses, or anything along those lines? Now, albeit this is not statistically sound all the way, but at least gets us an idea, we're looking for a negative correlation. Negative. Because you're trying to make face masks help prevent what we're looking at. And what we're doing here is we are not seeing that. Do you see it? No. That's what data analytics is for. Doesn't mean this is the proper model. I probably could refine it. There's a lot of confounding factors, but at least gives us an idea. Again, would you rather go vitamin D or would you rather go this? Well, one second. Put you on hold. One second. Apologize about that. I actually had a phone call come through. But this is exactly looking at this. See your correlations there? You don't want to look for one. Because one basically means hospital patients per million with ICU patient per million. All right, that's a positive correlation. What you're looking for here is a negative, and we're not seeing it. So let's start with this one first in the world mass aspect. See if we notice any changes. These are all the countries with the fours. I'm going to run through it real fast for the expediency. All right, and even then, for example, I'm doing facial covering right there for those recommended, uh, rec recognizing correlations. A point oh nine, for what it's worth. All right, United States mass level deaths per million. Remember, you're looking at two axes here. So the one axis here is axes, axes. Uh, one mass uh, axis. Yeah, that's why I don't like doing videos past midnight. Axis four, which means what you're looking at right here is required outside the home at all times, regardless of location, presence of other people. Which, uh, again, confounding factors, you know that's the recommendation. But however, though, that's not all states are abiding by that. And obviously, not all people are abiding by that. Zero, no policy, one recommended, two, da da da, three, da da, you get, you get the idea. So, the United States would like to see people wear masks continuously, even by themselves. 
And then we look at the mass level two in reference to cases per million. Now you see here is a four cases per million. Now remember two, we're entering the winter months. So this is part of what you consider confounding. And UV and also recommending people stay indoors, which is probably the worst thing you can do for those which actually do have COVID or SARS-CoV-2 or whatever you want to call it. And then here we're looking at tests per thousands. This is probably the strongest correlation is testing in cases. You always watch that little swing there. As we look at the other states, Sweden, mass level zero, deaths per million, to give you a perspective. Uh, case levels, yeah, it's been skyrocketing. But again, think winter time, think more mortality. Test per thousands, and we had to scroll down Columbia, doo -doo 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 -doo, Japan. People always think, oh, well, you know, we have prejudices. We think, oh, well, the Asia, they must be wearing masks continuously. Their mandate is a one. But again, there's a lot of other factors involved too. Look at the deaths per million. Look at the deaths per million continuously. Again, that's why epidemiology is so incredibly important. It could be diet, it could be a lychee berry, it could be shiitake mushroom, it could be from the you know, beta glucon, it could be the uh, hesperitin, the quercetin, it could be honeysuckle, it could be green tea. Remember, all the things that we discussed before that affect microRNA or block the microRNA, it's a huge part of the Asian diet as far as taking shoes off before coming to the house. Uh, a lot of these cultural standards play a huge role in disease prevention. And I hate to say it, you know, in the United States here, we have a high level of prejudice and should actually start looking at aspects of those cultures because as I look through all the charts, I mean, they're nowhere near impacted, anywhere near we are. So we really have to look at all those other issues. Japan, again, test per thousand, cases per million. New Zealand, boom, boom, boom. Uh, people think they're real stringent, yeah, and quarantines as far as people can in the country and things like that, yeah. But the media overplays the role. There's too much emotion into it, and it's not really how the rest of the world is working. Uh, now, this is always befuddles me. The cases per million, wow, they're doing incredibly well as well. Send the epidemiologists over there, find out what the heck they're doing. But you notice what I notice here is their cases, their tests per thousand and their cases per million look more realistic. Finland, mass level. Mass level, cases per million, right up there. Again, you need to have your controls because without controls, you can't see what, what you're doing is working or not. If I'm to use these countries as controls in reference to mass levels, what would I conclude? Again, you got to think, you, gotta, you, you ha, and any good scientist always seeks controls. But our entire argument here in the United States being played on being introspective, we're looking from inside the fishbowl as opposed to outside the fishbowl, and we're only looking at ourselves at a level of arrogance of not recognizing what may be working in these other countries. Or is it possible just that confirmation bias? We just keep on looking for it so much that we're finding it. India, mass level four, deaths per million. Look at the size of the country. Look at the sanitation. Look at how many, all the challenges that the Indian population have to deal with. And look at this. You would think they'd be as high as the United States. No. Look at that. Mm. But again, here's the correlation between test per thousand cases per million. Spain, as we went to the European countries. Uh, France. Remember they went way up here and all of a sudden just dropped. That's amazing. Uh, you notice, you see the test per thousand, cases per million, they dance right along. United Kingdom, right there. All this gloom and doom they're uh, predicting, they only a mass level of two. They went up, they went down, they went up. There's your test. Italy, only one I really have a solid concern for because they seem to have been losing a little bit of a handle on something recently. Uh, mass level went down, deaths per million went up. Uh, cases went up. But again, look at the test per thousand. Again, the test per thousand case per million was basically uh, a way of that Oxford University had of uh, basically communicating the data. And it really, really has a strong correlation between test per thousand and case per million. It, Oxford or our, our world and data got it right on cue. All right, everything else is numbers. Let's go basically to COVID states testing. And 
Now let's wait one second. Let's go to inve investigation. Let's do that first. Here's our heat map for the rest of the world. You see some ones. 0.95 here to death smoothed on um, population. Uh, but again, let's look at stringency in index. You have some negative correlations there. Diabetes prevalence. You have a 0.69 there, a point of 0.73 and 0.74. What do we have there? Total deaths per million and cases per million. All right, think about this. You want a negative correlation. If the strength of the index is actually resulting in saving lives, you want a negative correlation. The strength of the index in total cases per million, deaths per million, from a conf uh, from a basic numerical standpoint just staring at this chart again it is a huge assumption with all the confounding and everything else that can go into play with that that is our that's odd let's put it that way it's odd those that understand confounding know exactly what I'm talking about I'm not using the words but let the numbers speak for themselves let's see 0 0.9 age 70 and older well, that has to play with median age, and you can go down the line. Remember last time we looked at smoking? Uh, da, 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 female smokers, for whatever reason, uh, new death smooths. Look at that. Way low. Uh, you would expect it to be higher. But otherwise, let's continue forward. There's our numbers. Life expectancy. We used to think that that played a role with COVID-19, the mortality. Uh, this is the percentage, so keep that in mind. There's Japan. There's Greece. Greece is just being hammered on a percentage basis. There's the United States. Pretty low as a percentage of case mortality. Between we're looking at, I think we're looking at, yeah, total deaths per million uh, divided by total cases per million, new deaths per million divided by new uh, cases smooth per million as a percentage. All right, so there we are. Population density. We used to think, oh, people are, all close to each other, da da da. Again, what we're doing is not to reiterate or rehash old data, we're just trying to see if there's any correlations. All right, and there we are. Uh, that's current case mortality. Yes, that is true. These countries are not reporting or, or not having any cases to report. Um, total cases per million. Luxembourg has the highest amount. Then, fifth down is the United States, Belgium, Chechia, Montenegro. Luxembourg, you see all we've done the line there? Deaths per million, Belgium, these are the highest levels. The United States does not fare well the rest of the world, and our deaths per million just skyrocketed. I'll show you that in a little bit. And so we go down, 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 down. New deaths smooth per million. There's Sweden. Sweet. Now keep in mind, I have to be fair. Sweden started skyrocketing, but we're going to follow Sweden and see what happens. When we started doing this graphing, it was at 3.6 per million. Last time it was 7.2. Now we are at 7.879. So let's just do 7.9. Whoops. And let's see exactly who is doing better than the U.S. And what do we do here? We did da, da, da. We just took our numbers out. Let's try again. 7.9. And let's see who's doing better than the U.S. All these countries are doing better deaths per million than the United States. Because we're at 7.9. So there we are all the way down the line. And Sweden, again, we utilize. Think of the mass levels. Think of everything else. Uh, you know, again, it goes down to probably human development index as well. Because you're thinking, well, Afghanistan is doing that much better than the United States. Morocco, Ecuador, Indonesia... You get all the way down the line, deaths per million. Yeah, United States is doing not not the best. All right, and so here we continue down. Yeah, 7.879. That's pretty pretty hair raising compared to the rest of the world. I mean, compared to most of the world. All right, let us begin with uh, COVID state testing now. Let's go to this one. All right, what I'm looking at right here, correlation. The only correlation that we have I can actually come up with is total tests including negative and positive tests in results and resulting deaths. It's unusual uh, for, because it should actually have no relation unless someone is messing with the data. So let's look at the correlation as a whole. Uh, da, da, da. 
a point, this is California, a 0.977% correlation between total test results and deaths. Why? If anybody can answer that question for me, I'm all ears. Why? Remember, because total test results include negatives and positives. But to correlate it with that much with death is unusual. All right, let's go down the line here. That's our charts, percentage positive, da da da. This is, yeah, we'll just go down the line. This is the number, the death increase, which is red. I should have color coded this for you. I apologize. And this is the positive increase. You see the death? See the positive? All right. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the hospital uh, after this, the hospital occupancy rates. So keep this in mind. Positive to mortality. All right, I believe this is, this is California. Let's just scroll down, scroll down, heat map. There's your test results mortality correlation. We can predict it. Uh, you know, right down the line. Let's just get a number here. Let's say we do 300, let's see, 30 million tests. That would be between 23,116 and 24,806. Um, do we have a test here yet? That's how many tests we've done? California, we're at 29,112. And our mortality rate is at 22,432, which is extremely high. And if we hit, you know, always remember these numbers, if we have 30 million, we should be between these two numbers because the correlation is so incredibly strong. Many of you may recognize the slope figure. You could actually develop a slope to predict the future death rates based upon something as simple as a number of tests administered. All right, let's proceed forward. All right, we're going to go through basically our other states. In California, is not the strongest correlation. Keep that in mind. All right, here we are. Total test results to positive and so on and so forth as far as correlations. Now look at our other states. These are states with higher correlations than California. Alabama, I have no clue. Why does it have close to a one? That should not be there. All right, look at that. That is test results to deaths. Again, numerically, go to COVID tracking, whatever it is, pull up your own data. That is just bizarre. All right, Alabama, total test results to positive, so on and so forth, total test results to death. All right, as we go through the other states, this is our cases per million, positive increase, deaths to test. I'm just going to run through this real fast. Uh, mortality percentage, as you see, it begins to go down. Alabama again, just different chart. Oklahoma, let's just go straight to mortality percentages. All right, pretty much stabilized. All right, North Carolina. I'm trying to speed this up so we get to the more, I want to get to the hospital stuff fast. Mortality percentage, look at that, down below what it was before. By the time a vaccine comes out, who's going to want one? I mean, no, I mean, once the risk is beyond the benefit, uh, then why bother? All right, here it goes. And if you're going to get a vaccine, I would, if you could hold off to the attenuated, I would probably go the attenuated, but I'm not going to make that judgment call for anybody because that's a personal um, judgment. Uh, Brutality percentage per positive. Look at that drop. That's California. Remember Newsom saying, oh, where the hospitals are going to be full and so on and so forth. It doesn't mean it's not full. It means how does it compare it to prior years? Well, like the seat map. There's California's seat map. New York. What's the mortality percentage? Right down there. Again, we're playing a different game right now. I don't see a reason for a state of emergency. If you do, show me. That's perfectly fine. Show us. I'm all ears. And then Florida, interesting because they stopped the lockdowns. What's their mortality percentage? All right, you notice that correlation. That is similar between all states. The mortality percentage between this and this is almost identical between all of our measurements, you know, as far as going down. And looking down, down again. Again, there's a drop consistently, and they're all about the exact same level now, even though they weren't prior. Now they are. 
even though New York did not have that little role there. And I think that was that for that one. Now I'm going to go to the hospital occupancy. All right, here we go. Let's go back up. The reason it's important because we have a state of emergency being declared everyone everywhere now. And the original argument was, remember, flatten the curve, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. The problem is we have no perspective. So you're hearing all these numbers being thrown out when people never even followed hospital occupancies before. In the last video, we showed that hospitals were very full. They were using triage units. But that didn't have to do with COVID. That had to do with, in 2018, that had to do with the influenza season, even though COVID is by far uh, has a higher mortality level. But people don't have perspective. If you don't have perspective, then basically you don't have the rationale to make a solid judgment call. What is basically a state of emergency? All right, here are the inpatient beds. We're looking at a couple of different new sources here. We are going to be using open data, and I believe the human health and, human, human health and services uh, as well, too. Uh, da -da -da. There's a total ICU beds, ICU bed estimate. This is all the states. And so that means being used. So you see right there, this data is as of right here, December 15th. All right, so that was the last time it was updated. So four days ago. This red line here across the bar chart is the average hospital in bed utilization. That is the average. So for example, California is a little higher than average. It has not been unusual for it to be close to full before. But again, is it worthy of a state of emergency? And even then, the state of emergency for pandemic measures, is that even doing anything? Because obviously they're not actually reading or listening to data. It's like they're dogs chasing their tails. All right, they're more, I hate to say it without being too derogatory, they're not scientists. They're more into superstition. Because something sounds good doesn't mean it is. And that's what data, and that's what biostatistics is for, and that's what data science is for. All right, here we go, right there. And honestly, too, I believe at this point in the game, uh, ignorance or being naive is no longer an excuse. Now it's criminal because people are actually losing livelihoods and actually losing their lives uh, due to, um, I don't want to get any more political than that. I want to be nice. All right, so let's proceed forward. Patient in bed utilization, patient in ICU bed utilization. Uh, that's basically it is sorted that as far as going from this way to that way. That sounds. Then now we're going into basically this is the data from healthdata.gov. All right, that's the API we're using now. What, what I'm doing right now is we're utilizing two different data sources. This one has been updated as far as December 13th. These are the columns, which are all there. We're only going to be using a few of those columns. Because without perspective, we really have no clue if they're being serious or not. Now, keep in mind, inpatient beds could be inpatient beds available due to manpower. So basically, if they don't have enough people to man those beds, you have a drop. Each state, for whatever reason, reporting has this mid-drop there. All right, there's that. There's your inpatient beds used. This is inpatient beds used by COVID patients. That is California, which we are in a quarantine, a state of emergency, Christmas canceled, da da da, so on and so forth. But there is your data. Why do we have less inpatient beds being manned now than prior? Well, that can be because when you take, when you have um, daycare is available, but when you close schools arbitrarily or abruptly, it pulls healthcare workers off the front line. And in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, it was estimated 30% of the healthcare workers were pulled off the front line when they closed schools. So yeah, that could result in less inpatient beds being available because there aren't enough people to supervise those beds. All right, so basically let's keep on going down the line. New York, there's your ICU, there's your inpatient beds, there's your inpatient beds used. Florida, Again, interesting drop. Not much different than the other states. But again, keep in mind, Florida has no uh, restrictions like the other states do. In fact, with that in mind, let's go to COVID states and we'll wrap it up here for, if this is the right one. Because we want to see how Florida is doing comparatively. Uh, let's see. Da, da, da. Look at that. South Dakota. One person gets sick. It throws the whole graph off because we're not looking at a mean. 
looking at basically going across the board. All right, here we go. And positive per 100,000. Now, look who's higher. California. Where's Florida? Right there. Where's California? Right there. Where's New York? What's Florida doing in reference to mitigating against the pandemic? Far less than the other ones. Is there a difference? Well, California, we have a quarantine, state of emergency, da-da-da, the whole world is coming to an end. Uh, New York, well, they have Cuomo and de Blasio, that's enough said. And Florida, yeah. And, of course, people are waiting for Florida to explode with COVID cases, but, again, data, not emotion. All right, let's keep on going. And here we go as far as looking at death increase total per state. Look at that. Death rate has pretty much declined dramatically. Positive per 100,000 just between California, Florida, and New York since October. California, far more restrictive measures than Florida. Florida, right in line with New York. And New York has Cuomo and de Blasio. Deaths per 100,000. California, New York, Florida. And Florida has people eating outside. Or I think they even have people eating inside. And yet they have less deaths. Maybe because emotional state has a huge role to play in mortality. All right, we're going down the line here. This is more simple stuff. Da, da, da. Which one's this one? Because California has positive increase per 100,000. Wow. Where's Florida? Oh, it's blue. Up. Oh, it is above New York. Right there. It's December 15th. What's this one? This is hospitalized per 100,000. There's New York. Where's Florida? Florida's blue. Where are they? Out eating dinner. And let's proceed down the line here. This is the deaths, da da da, down the line, so on and so forth. I think we should wrap it up there because it is a late night and it's been gone quite some time. Again, uh, every Saturday or Sunday night or Sunday morning, we'll do the videos in reference to basically the, um, the data. Every two weeks, it appears that the major information comes out. So like, for example, next week, there's probably not going to be a lot that comes out in reference to SARS or COV-2. It seems to be in a 14-day cycle. But what do we cover? All right, let's begin. Refresh. Cadmium. Link to worse outcomes from influenza to COVID-19. We found a vitamin D deficiency. Real strikingly high in the United Kingdom at records level. All right, we found that, obviously that was from the before then, we found that vitamin D worked better than at least correlation-wise, in prevention of uh, COVID-19 or catching it than just about anything else, but albeit not media-worthy. Uh, auditory, no, COVID-19 does not damage the hearing like basically supposed. LED lights found to kill coronaviruses, which we know before, but this is the cheaper version, so it should be easy for everyone to do. Uh, mortality rates, we got a good comparison. If you're 85 or older, uh, yeah. Now, remember, too, a lot of countries kept operating. But what they did is they paid special attention to the elderly, took special care of them, isolation, and so on and so forth. And really, you know, again, paid attention to that age group in a caring way. And by doing that, as opposed to just isolating and just, you know, pushing away in the corner and basically surround wrapping everybody, you know, the medical resources can be far dedicated to those which were the most vulnerable. Again, that's mortality rates as a comparison. So we covered this, the mass matters. We covered the way that the media misportrayed this information in a way that basically can cost lives. It has very little to do with use masks, it has to do with filtration rate, but somehow they obviously did not read the study is that what it was yeah that's what it was so a surgical mask can be more harmful if the micrometer level is below a certain amount and reduction of airflow means that the virus the particulates that can cause the virus will reside in the nasal membranes far more effectively than if you wear no mask at all according to the data all right then we proceeded obviously right there the filtration rates uh temperature yeah, during the summertime, if it's warm outside, it looks like that may have a solid impact in reference to reducing the likelihood of uh, COVID infections, which ironically would be the time that, you know, 
basically a lot of them want to end the lockdowns in April of next year, which is supposed to be 15 days, not 15 months. Uh, yeah, there's your temperature information. Uh, UV, relationship. This is a good idea because the researchers said a correlation. It could be the UV light that destroys the COVID-19. It could be the uh, vitamin D levels being higher when there's a higher levels of UV. They really made a, a good emphasis on correlation. And there it is. And then that was only information once again. Again, the information you need in the APIs, the data source we use, our world and data, COVID tracking, uh, you know, basically the government, as far as the U.S. government is concerned, in reference to the hospital data itself we just used right here, which it's an API. is not really API. It's going to a CSV file and healthdata.gov. And then when I'm pulling from the CSV file and downloading it and then putting it into a pandas data frame, so on and so forth. Again, gratitude. Thank you. As always, links will be there for you to follow. I'll relink the Denmas study as well, too, as far as that is concerned. It got blown all over on the media, and now we're having tons of studies come out. And not tons. That's Now I'm exaggerating. We're having multiple studies coming out showing basically some of the weaknesses in the mask and how it's potentially the mask can be, in some cases, uh, exacerbating it. And if SARS-CoV-2 is aerosolized, I thought I had a particular chart in reference to that, but yeah, Ooh, almost forgot. Here it is. This particular chart right down here. So basically, if SARS-CoV-2 is aerosolized, and we're looking at basically right around this level, then, then we have an issue in reference to uh, masks uh, that has to be addressed. Again, Ralph signing off. Gratitude. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you all once again next week, and I'll see you next time. Catch you a bit. Bye.